see everybody. This is still September. It's still 2020. In case you've played Rip Van Winkle and missed part of 2020, we're still there. It's the end of September, and Aaron Schaefer is going to be teaching us the greatness of God's Word. So, Aaron? Good morning, everybody. God bless you all. Um, <clears throat> interesting talk this morning about working or work to do for God. Um, we're going to look at one of the greatest labors for the Lord, um, Jesus Christ. It's always a good, good uh, thing to look at. Um, I couldn't quite come up with a title for this teaching this morning, so I, I gave it a bunch. Jesus Christ, the whole Savior. Um, Jesus Christ, the Savior of all things, the restorer of all things. Um, our authority in him and rising to the occasion. I don't know. I couldn't come up with a title. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I kind of have been thinking about this a little bit. Um, on Netflix, they just came out with this, another uh, season of this show. It's called QB1, Friday Night Lights. And all it is is it's like a documentary series following um, these the senior year of these high school kids, uh, these quarterbacks. And they're, they're like the top three in the nation um, as far as the high school rankings go. And um, it's, it's insane watching that show because they're all little kids, you know. I guess I remember being a senior in high school. I felt like I was big. But now I look at them, they look like just little baby kids, you know. But um, it was amazing watching. So there's two seasons I watched. There's actually three seasons. I couldn't find the first season. But you watch, and it just follows these three seniors, these three quarterbacks at different schools, number one, two, three in the nation. And them realizing who they are, being number one in the nation is insane, for one. I mean, a lot of stars got a line physically and mentally to be number one in football. I mean, it's just, you can't just go practice and be number one. It's just not going to happen. But anyways, for them to realize their position um, and then kind of take ownership of the team led them to, led their team to national champs. Um, then there was some that didn't, which was fascinating. Now, I went and like looked at their uh, college careers afterwards. The ones that really embraced who they were and took charge of the team, took the captain role, led the team, um, they're up for Heismans in their college now. They're up for Heismans. These guys are bad to the bone. But, the, but something mentally had to click in their brains. Um, to really uh, recognize who who and what they were, what their abilities, what their talent was, um, and then to own it and to and to run with it. And but like I said, there was one in particular that he was like number two in the nation, and he couldn't would never step up and lead the team. He never even played in college. I mean, it was like crazy. The dude had so much talent mentally, he couldn't get there. Um, so anyways, I was just kind of thinking about that as, as far as who we are in Christ and, and, and what God's called us to um, in this day and time in our age. I know in the, in the uh, manifestations, a couple of times we heard um, since the foundation of the world. And, and, and um, we're going to be looking at that word, wor word world a little bit. It's a, it's in the Greek, it's aeon or A-I-O-N. Um, I think it kind of translated into, into translates into English as eons, like the eons, the ages, the times. Um, and we're going to look a little bit about that in Hebrews chapter one. We can start there. But I don't know, just something about accepting our role and, and not and not not um, thinking of ourselves like it says in, in Romans more highly than we ought to think. But we're supposed to think soberly. According as God has dealt to every man this measure of faith, what God has done through Christ, God has dealt to every man that believes, every born again man, woman, God's dealt this to all of us. Now, what has he dealt with us? And are we going to be big enough to, to really step out on it and, and, uh, and take the leadership role? It's, and not saying that we got to take a leadership role in the church. It's not really what it's talking about, but taking a, re a leadership role in this 
ministry of reconciliation, like Jim talked about, and taking a leadership role in this earth, in this, in our day and time, in our age, in this world, um, who take the role of what Christ, what God has made us in Christ. So another, another funny one, this is just a quick little visual. I think it was like at one of the G20 summits or something like that. And there's all these world, you know, prime ministers and presidents and whatever there. <clears throat> and somehow or another, they're all walking out. They're all coming out like onto the stage. And Trump somehow or another got behind them. And he, he was not having it. And he physically just grabs this one of this prime minister by the arm, moves him out of his way, gets in front of everybody, stands up, buttons his jacket, and he just stands there in front of everybody. I was like, all right, you know, are we busting through just standing like, all right, I'm a son of God, get out of my way. Um, I thought that was kind of a cool little visual. I don't know if he was right or wrong for doing it. I just kind of was like, yeah, America. <laughs> So anyways, look, we're going to do start in Hebrews 1, verse 1. And it's God. And I'm also going to be bouncing back and forth between um, Walter Cummings' working translation and the King James. Um, and I'll try to remember to tell you when I'm reading the working translation. But it's not too far from King James anyway. So, so in King James, God, who at sundry times or in various times and in various manners, Diverse uh, manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. So God spoke very many ways, very different, many different times to the fathers by the prophets. But now in verse two, he has in these last days spoken to unto us by his son, <clears throat> whom he has appointed heir of all things. So in these days, he spoken unto us. By a son who's, who, whom he has appointed heir of all things, Jesus Christ. By whom also he made the worlds, the, the eons, the aeons, A-I-O-N-S. Um, and then Walter translates that through whom, he has, through whom he also prepared the ages. So through Jesus Christ, heir of all things. And he through Jesus, he has prepared the ages. Um, so God has not only spoken to us by his son, but he's prepared, also prepared the ages to come through what his son accomplished. So the ages to come, he has prepared through Jesus Christ's accomplishments. Let's go to Hebrews um, 11. And we'll look at how another way he prepared the ages. Um, in Hebrews 11, verse 3, by believing or by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, or the ages have been fully prepared by the word of God, is what it says. Um, and let me read this little note um, that um, Walter puts in here. It says, the evil in the ages from the fall of man in Genesis 3 to this present age, it was not the result of God's intentions. But God planned for a redeemer to restore the conditions on earth. Well, we're going to look at, at some other stuff, too, about a restoring of the conditions, because it, it does talk about Jesus Christ restoring the conditions, not just on earth, but also in heaven. Um, but God planned for a redeemer to restore the conditions on earth, which is true to the way in which he had originally designed it. As a result of Jesus Christ's accomplishments, God has fully prepared the ages to come by his word. Now, we just read in, in Hebrews 1 that he prepared the ages through Jesus Christ, through the accomplishments of Jesus Christ. Here we read that he prepared the ages through his word. <clears throat> people in the past could look forward to the Christ. And people today may enjoy the results of his work. We today can enjoy the results of Jesus Christ's work because he has prepared this age for us by Jesus Christ's work and by the word of God. And we can look forward to the ages to come, the ages that are to come according to God's design and preparations. So I, I think it, I, I kind of like um, looking at the uh, that word world because it's used a lot talking about the, the world that then was or the, the you know, 
before the foundations of the world, the, the ages that we deal with now and the ages of the world to come. It's really not a new world. It's not a new earth. It, it wasn't the earth that was the, completely destroyed, you know, at the fall of, or when Lucifer in the war and all that, when God had to put it back together, the earth was still there. God just had to rearrange it again. So it was a new age, different ages. Um, I kind of like that word. So let's go to Galatians chapter one. And we're going to read verses three and four. <clears throat> so grace be to you in peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, e aeon, age, from this present evil age, according to the will of God, and our father so let me read this in working translation um who gave himself for our sins to, so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of god even our father so we've been rescued from this evil present age so we this is present tense age now right now it's the evil age um that's what god calls it but Jesus Christ has delivered us from this present and evil age. Uh, we don't have to accept what this age, what this world, what what this throws at us, because Jesus Christ has delivered it, uh, delivered us from it. This time frame, we're delivered. Now we do live in this present evil age, but Christ has delivered us from it. Let's go to Ephesians chapter one. In verse 10, and this is, um, you know, what Jesus Christ, what God has tasked him in doing. That in the administration or dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. So God is going to gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in where? heaven and which are on earth even in him so let me read this in again working translation so that in the administration of the fullness of times he might bring all things together under one head in the christ all things that is the things in heaven and the things upon the earth in him in the christ so all things all things in heaven, in earth, all things in Christ, all things together in him. Okay, so God kicks it up a notch there. Everything, you know, we're delivered from this present evil, evil, evil age. God's designed these ages according to Christ's accomplishment. He's designed these ages according to his word. Then he delivers us from this present evil age. And then God is working to gather all things together, both in heaven and earth, under Christ, into Christ, okay, under his under his headship. Let's go to Colossians chapter one. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians one, verse seventeen. Okay, and it says, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Or let me read this in working. He is before all, and he also he also put all things together in Christ. Okay. 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. So he's the head of the church, the head of the body, who is the beginning. He's the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence, all things. For it pleased the Father that in, in him should all fullness dwell, or all the fullness, to, it pleased God for all the fullness to dwell in him. It also, in having, wait, 
well, I started reading it, working. I'll read in King James. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. I'll read it in working. It also pleased God to reconcile all things to himself through him, thereby making peace through the blood of his cross. Yes, through him, whether things upon earth or things in heaven. He's reconciling. God is reconciling all things unto himself through Jesus Christ, whether it be on earth or in heaven. Jesus Christ is bringing everything back full circle, back around. You know, when the when Lucifer fell in the war, it just disrupted heaven too. It didn't just disrupt earth. You know, and Jesus Christ is the full savior. He's bringing it, reconciling all things, all things, both in heaven and in earth. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, this, this chapter is really dealing with some, some thought processes that came in to the church at Corinth about there not being a resurrection. And so the whole, the whole chapter really just deals with, um, you know, the resurrection. But there's a little parentheses in here that gives a little more insight into um, more than just dealing with the resurrection. It starts in verse... Um, 24 because it kind of departs from the main argument of resurrection and 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 all of that and christ coming back and all that stuff or the you know the rapture and it diverts just to give a little more in information and it says and this should be parentheses starting in verse 24 and it should and it, and it would end in verse 28 the parentheses so it's just a little um subject within the subject um so verse 24 then cometh the end so it's it's, ta it's talking about a little bit bigger than just the resurrection then the end comes then comes the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to god okay god the father when he when he when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power for he must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. Okay. Um, he's going to make, he's going to deliver over the kingdom back to God. When he has made inoperative, inoperative all rule and all authority and all power. So Jesus Christ is working. And it says, verse 25, because he still has to reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. You know, he's still working to put all enemies under his feet. Now, what's the last enemy to be destroyed? It says it in verse 26, death. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now that's a quote from, um, what, till he has put all things under his feet is a quote, but it's necessary for him to reign until he puts all things under his feet. Now the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. God has put all things under Jesus Christ's feet. He's gave him the authority. <clears throat> um, but when he says that all things are put under Jesus' feet, it's clear that God's accepted. I mean, God's not under Jesus Christ's feet, but he's given Jesus Christ the authority over all these things and has put all things under Jesus Christ's feet. Now, when it says that he put all things under his feet, it's manifest that he's accepted accepted god's accepted which did put all things under him and when all things shall be subdued unto him unto jesus all right and to god then shall the son also himself be subject unto him okay so god's given him the authority he's putting everything in heaven and earth reconciling it back to god and once all this is done once it's all reconciled back to god then shall the son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him so that god may be all in all okay so jesus christ is working getting all this stuff figured out the last enemy to be destroyed the last thing that he's going to do and he's going to reign until he gets all of these things destroyed the last one is death 
<clears throat> and then once all that is subdued and reconciled to God, then the son also himself will be subject unto God, is what it says. Kind of puts a damper on the whole uh, Trinity thing, but, you know, it's another argument. <clears throat> So, so that God may be all in all. So Jesus Christ is working, putting all this stuff back into subjection unto God, reconciling everything. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Uh-oh, neighborhood kids are here. Philippians 2. And we'll start in verse five. This is very interesting. Very, very, very interesting here. Okay. We're going to read five through 11. Um, now, I never had a problem with these verses. Um, just because I wasn't raised to ever have a problem with them. And I always worked for my dad. So it just never even clicked to me to think another way. But I know now from different here and different things that people take this odd, but I think we're going to take a really good look at this section and see how God worked, how God or how Jesus Christ in his mind, how he operated and how God worked with him to carry out this ministry that he had first in the gospels. And then now his ministry now reconciling everything. And actually everything's been put under his feet. The last enemy is death. But look, verse five, let this mind be in you, which also was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be what? Equal with God. Um, now, I never, like I said, I never took that to be weird because I always figured, you know, working with my dad, I, I could pretty much have the authority to do whatever I wanted um, working for him. Like if I spoke, it was just my dad did. Um, but I never was acting outside of my dad's will. Very rarely would I do that. And I would endeavor to never do that. Um, and But the working translation here is very inter interesting. It says, being in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God plunder for personal gain. So it doesn't, the thought process is not that he was not equal with God. The thought process is, that he didn't take his authority and his position to for personal gain. He didn't he did he thought it not robbery or he didn't use it for his own personal gain. Now, as a son, just in my mind of, of my father and working for him for 20 years, which I did, I could have used my position for personal gain. I could have lord lorded over the people um, you know, unjustly. And they would have still listened to me. But, you know, that's Jesus Christ. Instead, verse 7, he, em he made of himself of no reputation. He emptied himself of the reputation, took on the form of a servant. You know, he took on the form of a servant there. <clears throat> um, let me read this little thing here Walter wrote. This is really cool. Can you guys hear Moose howling back there? Um, so, oh, where did I read that? Oh, it's right here. What am I doing? I'm flipping around. So, in the Bible times, a son was considered equal with his father, whereas a servant was not. And although both a son and a servant may have served in the same manner. Now, I did the exact same work that all my guys, my dad's guys did. There was no difference. In fact, I just did more than they did. <laughs> that was the only difference. <laughs> um, but there was no difference between a servant's work or a son's work. Um, so. Although both a son and a servant may have served in the same manner in the family business, the son was different because he was an heir. He was an heir. So we did, I did the same work, but they weren't ever going to inherit the business. I could have inherited the business. Um, 
but a servant was was not an heir. So there, the, the, the work was the same. Jesus Christ, the work was the same as the servants. He did, never took his, his role uh, as to be plunder or for personal gain. And in verse 7, instead, he empties himself, makes of himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Now, not just obedient to death even the death of the cross, which he knew what was coming. It was going to be a horrible death, not just to die, but he took on all of that. Okay. He took all that on. The death of the cross, wherefore God also has highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things where? In heaven things in earth, things under the earth are buried, dead. That the dead gonna, the dead are gonna give up, the things under the earth, they're gonna bow. Um, the things on earth, they're gonna bow, and the things in heaven, every knee should bow. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <clears throat> so, see, Jesus Christ, humbled himself to be a servant. He humbled himself to do the Father's business, to do God's work. In fact, uh, just hold, just go to verse, um, it's like 22 or something. Where he's talking about Timothy, 22. Let me read this in working translation. However, you know the, the proven integrity of him, Timothy, how that as a son serves with a father, so he has served with me in the gospel. So as a son serves, as a son works with his father, Timothy was working with Paul that way. But it's just an example that they would use. This is in their mind frame. The son worked with the father. The, the son had the father's authority. This, this is how their thinking was. <clears throat> but So he took on himself the form of a servant, but he never did not know who he was. Now let's go to John. We're going to look at just an example of, of Jesus Christ how he worked, what he thought of himself, how he worked with people on earth, and what he thought of himself. You know, he took on the humble form of a servant. Well, he was humble, but he was cocky in who he was. He knew who he was. You know, he was he, he didn't use it for personal gain. He didn't use his authority and his, his position for personal gain. He used it to serve people and, and to do God's work. And here's just a just a good example of seeing it happen. Um, in John 5, 1, and we're just going to read this story. It's, it's 5, 1 through 22. We're going to read 1 through 22. So after this, verse 1, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool, troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, he was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Verse 5, and a certain man was there which had an infirmity, yet for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, and now think about this. And he knew that he had been now a long time in that case. Now, how did he know that? I don't know. Did he see him there for 30 years, however long Jesus has been alive? Or did God just show him? Boom. Pretty sure God, ding, ding, put a light on right then. Hey, boom. Focus in on this dude. Okay. Because Jesus is going to explain what, what's going on here in the next couple of verses. But or after we read down a ways. So he asked him, you know, wilt thou be made whole? Don't you want to get healed? And the impotent man answered him and said, sir, I, I don't got anyone. When the water starts bubbling, you know, no, no one's there to put me in the pool. And while I'm coming up, I'm wiggling my way up there. Another one steps down, gets it before me. Jesus says unto him, 
Rise, take up thy bed, walk. So what does he do? He took up his bed and walked. Hallelujah, he's healed. It's a great day. Been there 38 years. <clears throat> but dun, 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 on the same day was the Sabbath. See, Jesus was a, he was a sinner. Did, I hope, did you guys know that? He was a horrible, horrible sinner because he did this on the Sabbath. He happened to do this stuff on the Sabbath an awful lot. Man, he was horrible, Jesus Christ. What a, whew, we shouldn't even read this. This was such a bad example. So anyways, verse 10. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it is the Sabbath day. <laughs> So stupid. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Okay. Lord, don't ever let me think like that. <clears throat> Verse 11. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me. He, well, the, the dude told me, the guy that healed me, he said, Well, it's not my fault. He told me to take up my bed and walk. Then they asked him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he said, The guy that was healed said, I don't know. Who it was for Jesus had conveyed himself away. He turned away um, a multiple multitude being in that place. So afterward, Jesus finds him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. So the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus, and they sought to kill him. Because what? He had done these on a Sabbath day. Told you Jesus was bad. You, you guys. Didn't. All right, verse 17. But Jesus, this is the great answer. This thing is just, it's so simple. It's such a simple answer, yet this caused so much problems. They wanted to kill him just for this answer, let alone telling the guy to move his bed on the Sabbath day. You know, then Jesus Christ goes and throws this bombshell on him. Jesus answered them, My father. He's working hitherto. He's working. He's doing stuff right now. My father works hitherto. So guess what he does? I work. My dad's working. I got to work. You know, I got to work. My dad's, the business is going. I got to go to work. Got to help dad. 18, therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath by telling that guy to take up his bed and walk, but also, because he said that God was his father, making himself what? Equal to God. So this was such a big deal, being a son of God. Being a son made you an heir. Being a son made you equal with the father. Being a son was a huge deal. They wanted to kill him just for saying he was the son of God. Now listen to this. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Very verily I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself. So here again, he calls himself a son. He's he does is he is he backing down so he doesn't offend them? No, he's kind of pushing himself through. I'm the son. <clears throat> the son can do nothing of himself. Now he you know, don't you think he knew when he called himself the son what they were gonna freak? Of course he knew. The son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. What's he seeing the father? Oh, so, so he's walking along. He sees the guy. All of a sudden, he knows the guy's been there for a long time. Now, whether or not he knew he had seen him there by the bubbling, the pool, or whether or not God showed him right then, he knew the exact thing to do. Take up thy bed, walk. It was a Sabbath day. Bam, God's working. So what he sees the father doing, that's what he's doing. Okay? That's what he says. God's working in the situation. He goes, boom, I can't do anything of myself. Whatever I see God doing, that's what I'm doing. If God's working, I'm working. My father's working hither too. He's working on the Sabbath. I'm working on the Sabbath. <clears throat> These also does the son likewise. Whatever I see my, my father doing, I'm going to work. I'm going to do it too. These, is, these are what I'm doing. And I can't do it by myself. The son can't do it by myself. For the father loves the son, verse 20. And shows him all things that he's doing. God's showing Jesus all things that he's doing. Because they're in the family business. They're working. He's showing them. Teaching them how to sand the bumper. 
to wax on and wax off. Um, For the Father loveth the Son and showeth shows him all things that he himself do that himself does, and he will show him greater works than these, so that you may marvel. God's going to keep doing big things. We're working hard together. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. I mean, he he didn't back away from his authority. Yes, he humbled himself to be a servant. He didn't back away from his authority. Even so, the Son quickens whom he will. 22, for the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Boy, he's, he's being bold to these guys. Very bold in who he was. Very bold in who he is. He was a son. That They wanted to stone him just for saying that because that made him equal with God. That made him heir of the inheritance of God, whatever that was. All right? And then he says, God committed all the judgment to his son. Of course, what God sees the father do, do that's what he's going to do. You know. But he, he gave... Jesus Christ, he's like, well, here's the business. You're running the, here, I'm giving you all this authority. You're running this, you're running that, running this. Of course, Jesus always checking in with God, checking in with God, checking in with God. How do we do this? How do we do that? How do we do this? You know, in 1 Corinthians 6, 3, you know what it says that we shall do? Judge angels. You know, I was dealing with um, strife within the church, and they were going to, you know, unbelievers to figure out their problems. And Paul's like, dude. You guys can figure this out. You're going to be judging angels. You, you can judge these little matters. But still, it said we're going to be judging angels. All right, let's go to Romans chapter 8. So where does that leave us? Good question. Let's start in verse 15. There's so many good things in here. You know, another example I thought of with Jesus Christ just dealing with the people and his authority was when they tore off the roof and lowered that guy through the roof on his bed. And then he looks at him and he goes, oh, your sins are forgiven. And they're like, what? You can't do that. And he goes, well, just so you know that God gave me the authority to forgive sins, take up your you know, now you're healed. What's it easier to say I forgive your sins or tell the guy to be healed? And just so you know, I can forgive sins. He's up healed. <clears throat> Where are we? 815. So we haven't received the spirit of bondage. Or we haven't received a spirit, a spirit of bondage to again cause fear. To, to keep us in fear all of our lives. But we have received the spirit of adoption. Now, it's not adoption. It's sonship. Sonship spirit. We have re received the spirit of sonship, whereby we cry, and the word cry is shout. We shout. Abba, or Father. We're sons. We have a father. God is our father. This is big, bold talk. Because what are you if you're a son? You have the authority. Now, God placed the authority in us. Now, what's it say? Next verse, the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, what? Heirs. We are heirs, heirs of God, and what? Joint heirs with Christ? No way. Now, see, you always read that, but but the amount of impact that this had in their minds was big deal. It was a big deal, right? Because if we're sons, why does it say in 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 Colossians or um? In Philippians, to let this mind be which you be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. 
okay, to be a son, to have that, have that authority. Let this mind be in you is what it says, okay? Now, he didn't take advantage of his situation. He didn't take advantage of his authority. He didn't take advantage of what he had to make to his own profit, but he did it, but he didn't lessen it. He didn't not take advantage of what he's supposed to. He didn't, you know, reject his authority. He took full advantage of it, how God would have it to be taken full advantage of. He just didn't take advantage like a filthy lucre, you know, to, to profit himself alone. So if we're children, verse 17, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. Um, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Boy, we got a whole lot of stuff that I don't know if we even know what we have. I, I mean, honestly, I'm, this is, I'm, to me, going through this is like dipping my toe into it because there's so many other verses I, I could read about this stuff. Um, but what is our position? I think it's a little higher than we think. Jesus Christ's job is reconciling everything, heaven, earth, everything back to God. We're heirs with that. Okay? We're in this business. Ministry of reconciliation. We're working the business. We got authority. We have some major authority. Major authority. Um, let's go back to Ephesians 1. So that's kind of what I just wanted to point out what, you know, that what Jesus Christ is doing is a big deal. And we're part of it. We're part of the family business. God's made us children. We, we shout, Father. We shout that he's our God. <clears throat> Why? Because we're heirs. We're joint heirs with Christ. We're heirs of this thing. Um, Ephesians 1.10. And we, we read this one, that in the, did we read it? Yeah. That in the administration of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, in him. And in him, in Christ, we were also chosen, in, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. We predestinate according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And that sealed is sealed. Like it's not coming unsealed. And which is the earnest or the token or the down payment, like when you put earnest money down. That was the earnest money God put on, of our inheritance. That's proving our inheritance, that that spirit is the token. It's the earnest of our complete inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession <clears throat> under the praise of his glory. So wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, love unto all the saints, Paul does not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom or spiritual wisdom and spiritual revelation in the knowledge of him. God wants us that we have spiritual wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him so that the eyes of our understanding are enlightened so that we know what is the hope of, the, of his calling, what the hope of his calling is and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints is. Okay. He wants us to know these things. We're children. We're heirs. Join heirs. Wants us to have that spiritual wisdom and understanding where we stand in this life now. What our job is in this ministry and what our authority is. That what it really means when it says that Christ has delivered us from this present evil age. Okay. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And oh, this little thing called the exceeding greatness of his power. He wants us to be spiritual, have spiritual wisdom and revelation and understanding in this area too. The exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe in this power, this exceeding, exceedingly great power is according and shown forth according to the working of his mighty power, which he showed in Christ when he, oh, you know, just that little bit of power that it took to raise him from the dead. 
Yeah, just that power that set him at his own right hand. He wants us to understand what that that is available to us, word who believes. The succeeding great power that raised Jesus from the dead. The succeeding great power is available to us, word who believe. That power is according to set him at God's own right hand in the heavenly places. That power that put him far above all principality. The power, the power that put him all above all other powers. The power that put him all, above all other might, all other dominion. Every name that is named, not only in this age, this age now, that power is available to us word who believe that is, it has put him, that power is greater than all of that, not only in this age. It's in this age, though. It is in this age. That, that exceeding great power is available to us word. It is in this age. It says right here. Not only in this world, but also in the world to come. It's the same word, eon. Not only in this age, but also in the ages to come. See, God has put him above everything. And that succeeding great power is available to us in this age, also in the ages to come. Um, it's every name that is named not only in this world not only in this world see all things in heaven too he's he's reconciling everything and putting everything under christ's feet jesus christ is putting it back to went to before to the original creation before lucifer and all that even fell <clears throat> he has put all things under his feet all things both in heaven and on earth. And he gave him to be head over all things to the church. Another one of his responsibilities. He gave him to be head over all things to the church. He's our Lord. He's our boss. God's his boss. God's our boss too. Because we're sons. And we're joint heirs. And this church, verse 23, is his body. We are his body. And it's the fullness of him that fills all or all things and then all people. So if all things are under his feet, he gave him to be the church, head of the church, right? But he put all things under his feet and we're the, we are the church. We are his body. That's what I'm saying. Where are all the things under for us, under our feet, right? Right, because we're, we're sons, just like him. We're joint heirs. And then I, and you know, in that one verse, I, I, I think it was in Philippians, but it says that he suffered or he was a, no, yeah, it wasn't Philippians, that he was obedient even a, to, to death, even the death of the cross. You know, he took that beating and he took all that and he, he did, he went through all that he went through so that we could be joint heirs with him. You know, he did that so that we could be sons just like him. That's why he took away his reputation or he he wanted he he could have been the only one you know he could have been the only son but he took it away so that we were joint heirs so that we were children just like him so that we had the, the inheritance so that we had this power and that we were helping to restore all things we have this ministry of reconciliation but we're going to be restoring all things you know, both in heaven and on earth, because he's put him far above all principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is named, not only in this age, also that which is to come, put all things under his feet. He's head over all things to the church, and the church is his body. So we're everything's under our um, feet, too. And the authority that we have now, now in this day and time when we're walking with God and doing the Father's business is that of a son. It's let that mind be in you. It's that of a, an heir. It's that of working at the family's business and having the authority. <clears throat> and um, so anyways, that's what I wanted to share with you guys this morning. And um, I'll pray real quick. So God, just thank you for uh, just continue, continually revealing your word to us bigger and greater every day. God, help us to stand in your boldness in your uh, power your authority and in your wonderful love and humility also god and thank you for uh, the rest of this week for everybody and for a wonderful day in the name of jesus christ amen